We are starting our fourth session um, of We Want Our World Back. The theme for today is education. Es un tema muy importante, educación. Um, yo quiero rememorar aquí a una filósofa catalana, um, Marina Garcés, que dice que educación es aprender a vivir juntos y juntos aprender a vivir. Tenemos un panel extraordinario, yo estoy muy nerviosa de estar aquí y contenta. I'm, I'm very glad to be here and a little bit nervous also. Um, vamos a tener tres panelistas eh, que voy a presentar. Vamos a tener un tiempo de una hora y media para la sesión eh, y un poco más para las preguntas y respuestas. I'm going to present you in the order you are going to speak. Um, first, we will have Andrei Grub Grubacic. He's the chair of anthropology and social, social change changes in the department of CEIS in San Francisco. He is editor of the Journal of World System Research and he's affiliated faculty of UC Berkeley. And also he um, passed time in Coimbra, as he told me. So he has multiple books, publications, um, I will just uh, name Living in the Edge of Capitalism, Adventures in the Exile, and uh, Mutual Aid. After that, we will have the uh, participation of Shoshan Sima. He's not here with us, but we will have, it, have her in the internet. Um, I will make the presentation later on then. And afterwards, we will have John Holloway, which is here. So I think we can start giving the word to Andre. Andre, you have like 25 minutes to develop a, an extraordinary theme I've, I find that is in praise of agnotology. He will explain us what's this, <laughs> the politics of knowledge in democratic modernity. So, Andre. Thank you. Let me go. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I will try to speak as slowly as possible for the translators, interpreters. I want to mention at the very beginning two friends, very dear friends who are recently deceased. One of them is Snotton Lind. For those of you from the United States, you probably know who he was. A great educator from SNCC, Students for Nonviolence Committee, Nonviolent Society SNCC. Well, in any case, a man who meant a lot to me. And the other one is Mike Neary who also recently passed, also a very close friend of John's. And from these two people, I learned a lot from what education is and what revolution should be about. And what I learned, I think, is that as educators and as revolutionaries, we need to combine and somehow balance capacity for endless capacity, for moral outrage because we don't want to become cynics, and it's so easy to become a cynic. And at the same time, you have to, or we have to, or at least we should, have the capacity for endless patience, because we don't want to become sectarians, and it's so easy to become a sectarian. There's nothing as ugly for a revolutionary or for an educator to be a sectarian. So combining those two is something that I always try to do and always recommend as one of the best ways to approach education and to approach what it means really to be a revolutionary. And the third person I would like to mention is my daughter, Tanya, who teaches me the third thing that I think is really important, and it is love. You know, we come to this world 
in order, we come to this struggle, really, in order to fight against suffering. And the last thing that we want to do is to add to that suffering. Our struggle, the way that we wage it, the struggle against the world of suffering, against the world of pain, should be a joyful one. And we should organize our struggle in a way that it contributes and enriches our lives. So, love. And love, I think, is something that makes me speak today on this particular topic. And topic is education. Because without love, what is revolution really? What is education really? What really is that we are doing? Why are we in this struggle if it's not for this new world that we want to build, impregnating it, living it in a way that prefigures a different kind of society? So education, which is defined by Abdullah Hojalan as a collective effort of the society to pass its experience in the form of scientific and practical knowledge to its members, particularly its youth, is something that I would like to defend in terms of autonomous education. And autonomous education, in the way that I speak about this, autonomous pedagogy, is something that is far more preferable, not only in terms of politics, but also in pedagogical terms. And it is also, to use the language that we are using here at this conference, the essential part of the project for democratic modernity. So, Autonomous education came to life as a, ah, I assume this means slower. It's a cute wave. It came to life as a response to what Tolstoy, one of the greatest anarchist educators, has called the horrible order of things. And that is what we call today at this conference, in this conversation, the system of capitalist modernity. Now, the French Revolution, introduced three very important things. Namely, that social change is normal, that it unfolds within the political framework of a modern nation state, and that sovereignty rests on something called the people. The World Revolution of 1848 brought us many different things, anti-systemic movements, but also the domination of centrist liberalism as the defining ideology of capitalist modernity. And centrist liberalism, it's important to note, has imposed its ideology in five crucial spheres. The first was the creation of the modern nation state. The second was the exclusive concept of citizenship. And when I say exclusive, I meant that it excluded women, it excluded working classes, it excluded the ethnic racial others. The third element was the private property regime. The fourth element, which is very interesting for us today, given the topic, was the emergence of social sciences as organized research of the social world with human development organized into distinct stages. And finally, the fifth was education, imagined as the cornerstone of capitalist civilization. And this is what German philosopher Fichte had in mind when he wrote that the state which introduced national education proposed by us would ne need no special army at all, but would have in students an army such as no age has yet seen. It's a chilling statement. This is most certainly what Bismarck had in mind when he said that every Prussian teacher is my representative in the classroom and every Prussian should carry a gendarme in his breast. I want to have a race of reserve officers in each and every classroom, Bismarck. Now this is the same principle of Rua and Gehosam of silence and obedience that you can find today in a less exalted form by a contemporary American pedagogist who says that education is one of the most important phases of government. So the conventional history of education is an extremely boring history. It's a history that begins with Pestalozzi, with Froebel, with training colleges, with mass public education, with John Dewey in the United States, with 
progressive education of Montessori, with the so-called new educationists, perhaps a bit of Waldorf school, at least here in Germany, and perhaps some critical education theory if you're in the United States. But what is excluded, very conveniently and by purpose, is the rich history of autonomous education. The principle of autonomous education could be expressed very simply. It is an attempt to minimize the exercise of authority and maximize the autonomy of the student. But the autonomous perspective on education, the autonomous pedagogical model, and I think we should call it that, is far more complex and coherent than, wave again, than conventional accounts would allow for. So, in order to see this history, we must become what Barry Gills called the other day, the conscientious objectors of capitalist modernity. But we also need to become agnotologists. And it's a funky term, right? That comes from Irish social historian by the name of Ian Ball, who coined it. Agnotology as a science of ignorance. And Ian says that, and I think he's right, that we need, in order to understand, capitalist modernity, we need a science of ignorance, we need to understand the way how ignorance is socially and politically constructed. So in a sense, capitalist modernity itself, intellectually speaking, is organized production of ignorance. Ignorance, Ian writes, has a distinct changing political geography and we need political agnotology in order to complement our political epistemologies, big words. But what Ian really means by this, there are some experiences, some histories, some processes that are from the very beginning produced as invisible, as unproductive, as impossible, and as utopian. And our role as agnotologists should be to recover this waste of experience, to make these experiences visible, to restore to them the dignity of credible alternatives, alternatives again to what Tolstoy used to call the horrible order of things and we call capitalism. Now let me give you a taste of the conversation about autonomous education that unfolded throughout the centuries. In 1892, Pyotr Kropotkin, the anarchist prince, was writing to his friend Elise Reclis asking him for advice about the title of his forthcoming book. And at least suggested Conquest of Bread and offered the following explanation. We anarchists have a triple ideal. Bread for the body, since everybody has the right to eat. Brotherhood, or what we might call bread for the heart. And education, or bread for the spirit, since everybody had the right to develop his or her full potential. A few years later, in 1896, Leo Tolstoy wrote to Jean Grave, who was at that time the editor of the anarchist paper Le Temp Nouveau, but also one of the founders of the League for Libertarian Education, extremely important organization that was founded in France. And Tolstoy said, I started my political activity with the school and teaching, and after 40 years, I am more convinced that only by education, free education, can we ever manage to rid ourselves of the existing horrible order of things and replace it with a different organization. One year later, Jem Guillem wrote, no longer there be schools governed by a pedagogue where the children wait impatiently for the moment of their deliverance where they can enjoy a little freedom outside. In their gatherings, children will be entirely free. They will organize their own games, their talks, systematize their own work, arbitrate disputes. They will early be accustomed to public life, to responsibility, to mutual trust and mutual aid. The teacher whom they have themselves chosen to give them lessons will no longer be detested as a tyrant, but a friend to whom they will listen with pleasure. He quoted William Godwin, who wrote, let him be believe that he is always in control though it is always you who really controls. There is no subjection so perfect as that which keeps the appearance of freedom. According to the method he recommended, it is suggested that the student go first and teacher follow. 
Francisco Ferrer, who was also inspired by the writings of Godwin, reminded that, yes, Godwin is correct, and children should left or be left to themselves and their natural motivation. Then they will organize spontaneously. We think, he said, that disorder is growing greater and greater and that there are no limits to it. Whereas in the classroom, we only need to wait a little more and the disorder comes down naturally by itself, growing into a much better order than what we have created. And this was repeated or restated several decades later by the de-schooler Ivan Illich, author of the famous book Down With Schools. And he said, the bad results are always produced by a method which is too conscious and deliberate, by a discipline which is imposed from without, which is the command of a drill sergeant. The good results are produced by apparently no method at all or by a system of hints and suggestions. And the discipline which undoubtedly exists and must exist arises out of the activity itself and is in fact a concentration on tools and materials and absorption in concrete things. Many decades later, British art historian Herbert Reed wrote to anarchist educator Paul Goodman saying, the choice between authoritarianism and anarchism lies in the classroom and school, not factory, is the primary arena for anarchist action. School thus becomes the model, he says, for the institutions and processes of free society. And education is not the end, but the means for the positive world of cooperation. Possibly the most important lesson the school ought to teach is the way to build the institutions of free society. The question is, Goodman replied, is it possible to teach somewhat in the way children learn how to speak by intrinsic interest with personal attention and relating to the whole environment of activity? Now, finally, several decades later, writing from his prison cell on the Imrali Island in his book, Sociology of Freedom, Abdullah Hojalan wrote that in capitalist modernity, nation state control of education is vital. The bourgeoisie is the class that accomplished the most far reaching monopoly over society in terms of education. When primary and secondary school were made compulsory, the clamps of dependency imposed on the youth became impossible to avoid. Force, financial power, and education have become the irresistible weapons within which society is colonized. Revolution of meaning will be successful only when society's educational institutions interpret scientific, philosophical, artistic content the way that removes them from the alliance of social science power structures. A true objective of morality and politics is social education. Now these comments scattered across history collected across history, give or reveal the essential outline of the autonomous pedagogy. Now, this educational model that I'm calling autonomous education is coherent, consistent, and has long and distinguished history. The common capitalist trick is to dismiss it as a kirk of eccentric individuals, where in fact they were in dialogue, these people that I quoted across time and space, Discussing autonomous education, sometimes as a principle and other times as a movement. Now, <coughs> autonomous principle in education seems to have been a constant feature of the educational discourse, and in each generation, somebody would pick it up. The first to do so was probably William Godwin, who exhibits particularly well three distinguishing characteristics of autonomous education. Non-coercive pedagogy, belief in natural learning based on natural motivation, and concern about the autonomy of the child. Now, these three characteristics have distinguished autonomous positions in education from Godwin, Paul Robin, Francisco Ferrer, Sebastian Faure, and Leo Tolstoy, all the way to Summerhindel, Paul Goodman, to free schoolers and these schoolers, and to contemporary social movements in Latin America and Kurdistan. 
Autonomous education, it's important to note, is not a more radical version of progressive education. It has consistent social, political reference that progressive education lacks. The basic concept of autonomous education have a meaning only in relation to freedom, which is not a context-free, abstract content, but one that carries very concrete political and pedagogical connotations. It is an education that liberates. It has consistency, or in, it is in this consistency and seriousness with which autonomous educators relate all aspects of education to liberatory principle. This is where autonomous education differs from the relaxed liberal progressivism, and it is this consistency of the relationship that makes it possible to speak about autonomous approach as constituting a distinct alternative educational model. Now, as a movement, autonomous education emerged in France in the 1890s. Then it appeared in Spain. And after that, it became an essential part of the global radical culture of this period. In its first phase of existence, in the, what is sometimes called the long 19th century, it was associated primarily with the anarchist movement. After 1920s, it was associated first with Marxism, then with psychoanalysis, and then with anti-colonial struggles, without ever losing the connection to early anarchist educators like Tolstoy or Paul Robin. The most important elements most important elements of the autonomous pedagogical model include something called integral education, cultural learning in small groups, if possible, reality of the encounter and the continuum of experience, natural motivation, voluntary attendance, theory of internal emergent order, self-government of the school, and the complementary role of the teacher. Now, I will try to focus, given the time restrictions, uh, on each one of these. And I will probably start with the notion of integral education. And that story really begins with the first great rebellion against the capitalist modernity, which is the Paris Commune of 1871. During the Paris Commune, there was something called Educational Committee that was formed. And the chair was Valian, name that we don't repeat much and don't remember much anymore. But these people were remarkable. And what they did was immediately set up incredibly ambitious educational program based on two things. First one, it was anti-clerical. It was completely secular. Girls were taken from the schools, run by nuns, because everything was controlled by the church, <coughs> and taken to what was called the integral schools. Integral schools or professional schools were absolutely everywhere during the Paris Commune. And the main idea was to combine intellectual, moral, and practical or physical education. In the quote that was used widely, education should combine practical knowledge with industrial arts and scientific knowledge. And it should be extended primarily to girls because, and this is Paris Commune, this is 1871, because it is with women that liberation properly begins. Now, Paris Commune, as we all know, unfortunately did not end well. It ended in bloodshed, but some of this legacy continued. And the more important one, or probably the most important one at the period was the integral education. The term itself was probably coined by Fourier, so it has the utopian past. And it refers to the education of the whole being, integral education, but not education that is individual, education that is free, education that is collective, and education that focuses on what he called papillonage, on workshops, practical education. And then this was developed later by Pierre Joseph Brunon, who invented the term demopédie, which means self-government of education. And he stated that education is central importance in the liberation of the working class. So integral education for Poudon, for Bakunin, for many other educators of that time, again, meant moral education, meant intellectual, academic education, and practical physical education.
But the most important educator of this generation, more than Francisco Ferrer even, is Paul Robin, who was the first one to actually publish an essay on this topic, and the first one to create an autonomous educational school. It was in 1880 in Campu, in France, near Paris, where he took uh, a position of a director of an orphanage. And he organized it until 1894. It was a remarkable experience where the whole school, and perhaps today this sounds like a normal thing, but in those days it was absolutely extraordinary, was organized as a museum. There was a meteorological station. There was a school. There was a theater. There was absolutely everything because the environment is what educates. Life is what educates. And it was decidedly anti-clerical. It was completely secular. And it was co-educational, which in those days was extremely difficult to pull off. He somehow did it for 14 full years. And then, of course, because of his advocacy of birth control movement and other things that he was doing, he was dismissed. And this wonderful experiment was sort of folded in the conventional experience of French curriculum. But he inspired so many people. And he inspired the burgeoning movement, which we call syndicalist movement, or sometimes solidarist movement, that started in France. And one of the main things that they did was to promote schools that were called autonomous universities. Now, the first autonomous university was built in Paris in 1898. By 1902, there were 75 only in France. There were two in Buenos Aires. There were seven in Belgrade, where I am from. There were three in Macedonia. There were five in Paraguay. So this was an absolutely fascinatingly global institution that was focused on adult education, what people called continuous education. It was founded by the anarchists, who later on to, uh, continued to create something that was called model schools. And model schools were schools that were set up to exemplify autonomous education in action. The most famous one was something called the Beehive, organized by Sebastian Faux, the man who invented the term liberté. And this was probably, again, a remarkable experience that created quite a stir in France at the time, because, again, it was co-educational, it was atheistic, and it involved all three elements, moral, physical, practical, and intellectual of integral education, focused on the education of the working class or working class children. He learned the lesson from Paul Robin, and he said, this school does not belong to the state. The only way to build autonomous education is by creating something that is completely separate, completely independent from the state. And it's an important lesson to learn. Because every time libertarians, autonomous educators, try to make any kind of compromise with the state in terms of the education, it did not end well. And neither did Sebastian Ford's school, the Beehive, but because of the First World War. However, he was able to inspire the International League for the Rational Education, which was formed in 1908, League for Libertarian Education, formed in 1896, several journals, like La Scuola Laica, L'Ecole Renové, the whole system, really, international communication system of autonomous education. He inspired a very young man by the name of Francisco Ferrer, who was exiled from Spain and who went to France to study with Paul Robin. And he then met Sebastian Faure. And he created a system known as Modern Schools. Modern School was such a familiar name in 19th and early 20th century that is difficult to relate to them today because they're almost forgotten. But wherever you were in the world in 1910, say, there would be a Modern School. And Francisco Ferrer created a system that he called rational education. Now, it's a tricky term. They use the term rational education to confront what they call the emotionalism of the state, emotionalism of the nation, 
emotionalism of hierarchy. So they created a system that was decidedly rational, scientific, based on the observation of facts, but it was free. That was, again, mostly directed towards the education of the working class children, and it was uh, spectacularly dangerous from the perspective of people in power to the extent that Francisco Ferrer was implicated in the so-called murder, assassination of the king, eventually killed in the anarchist tragic week of 1908. And he had become the martyr of education and his association, later known as Francisco Ferrer Association of Modern School, has become the most powerful vehicle of promoting the ideas of autonomous education for almost a century. Only in the United States, we had 22 schools that called themselves modern schools. Jack London, Upton Sinclair, Man Ray, they were all teaching in modern schools. In uh, New Jersey, I think the name was Neely Deke and James Deke, if I remember well, fantastic educators. They were doing this for 50 years. They left incredible traces all over the United States. But modern school really was a phenomenon that was truly a global phenomenon. As was the school created by Madeleine Verlaine, L'Avenir Social, and many other schools that had the name of modern school. In 1870, Russian novelist Leon Tolstoy wrote that he will stop writing his book, Anna Karenina, because he couldn't really write about fictive characters, but there are so many imaginary, so many real characters that he needs to educate. So he left for Marseille, and he was observing kids in Marseille, and he said, well, there's something really strange, strange happening here. If you go to Marseille, and if you go to a school, you would think that children are slightly limited. There's something wrong. If you go to the street, you will see children running, laughing, having a great old time. What is wrong here? And he made this distinction, a very helpful one, between culture and education. Culture is everything that develops a person. Education is culture under restraint. It's a limited culture. What we need to do is to create the environment in which children are going to be able to be educated by culture not by education, by reaching from within, by reaching to the natural motivation of children, allowing them to create themselves spontaneously, the internal order, without external rewards, without penalties, without punishment, with what he called horizontal curriculum that is created together with students and professors meaning teachers. And Jasne Apolyana, his school, has become one of the models that was replicated almost everywhere. Again, the long 19th century. And then after that, and I don't have much time, it's such a beautiful history, and it requires an agnotology. It requires an effort of research, of recovery of these experiences. We had schools like Summerhill, the free school movement, that began with the idea that we don't have a gendarme, a cop in our breasts, but the father in our breasts. The idea was that psychoanalysis, therapy for freedom in a certain sense, will be able to liberate, liberate us. Boarding schools, removing you from the family, and create because the family was the problem, creating a new kind of context of freedom. And that was criticized, but it was also extended by people in, say, Latin America. Paulo Freire was under the same and developing under the same influences. Ideas of self-awareness, he, he owed a lot to Freud. But he was also inspired by the anti-colonial education, by Franz Fanon, by Memi, by many others. Even by Tanzanian president. Now, of course, autonomous education in a nation state, but still, Nyerere in Tanzania, it's one of the most interesting examples of autonomous education. They kicked out the English. They created or recreated a system of education based on autonomous principles. They went back to the indigenous ways of doing things, pre-colonial, not only anti-colonial, recreated a system of integral education that was remarkably similar to what Ferrer and Tolstoy were doing. And from there, you can find a link to Ivan Illich, Everett Reimer, 
and many other de-schoolers who are writing that sh down with the schools, school is dead, creating a new kind of critique or distinction perhaps between manipulative institutions and convivial institutions. Manipulative, those who indoctrinate you with a passivity that make you the meat, this is a quote, for the state, that create wheels in your head and control you in the way through what something that uh, Illich called the hidden curriculum. And convivial institutions, which are something that is completely different, something that is creative, something that is inspiring. Now, all of those ideas, repeated by Paul Goodman, by John Holt, Kozol, and all the other ideologues who are writing about free schools. Parkway School, very famous in Philadelphia, and more than anywhere else, interestingly enough, in Denmark, 162 free schools. The most famous one was Nile Little School, in which there was no teaching. There was no formal curriculum. There was no teacher. There was nothing formal, but the conversation never stopped. The conversation was endless. And the way that teachers were teaching were based on the idea of feedback, the idea of a complementary presence, the idea of removing any external pressure, any external reward, and observing how a completely different situation actually comes about. And you can find this same principles today in Latin America. There was, I think, I believe, a workshop on Zapatista education, which is well known. But there's also a landless workers movement. Landless workers movement has reinvented integral education with its intellectual, moral, and uh, practical component. It has more than 200,000 students, 4,000 teachers. Same with the intercultural university in Ecuador. Same with the schools in Cochabamba. Same with Piquetero schools in Argentina that used to exist related to the unemployed workers' movements. That was, and it is, and it continues to be an incredible experience, educational experience. When the movement itself becomes an educational actor and pedagogical intent is everywhere. And same, of course, goes for the schools in, or academies in the Kurdish regions, where education becomes paideia once again. Education is like this conference. Everything educates. The environment educates. Education is political. Education is based on what autonomous educators call the reality of encounter, on things that matter things that are real, taken from your everyday life, from your meaningful everyday activity. And that, for autonomous educators, was always crucial. Now, what do we do with all of this experience? And there is so much more. I mean, I could be talking about this for, an hour, for literally for hours. But what do we do with this experience? Yes, autonomous education should liberate us from fear, from silence, from obedience and should prepare us for a positive world of cooperation, for a society that is structured around principles of cooperation, principle of mutual aid. And it cannot, as Abdullah Hojalan says, be separated from democratic views about the nature of the moral society. Its relationship to capitalist state society is not one of retreat, should not be one of retreat, but should be one of conflict. And even at this university where we're supposed to be teaching, speaking, being convivial, well, we were sort of criminalized out of it. That is the compromise with the state that Ojalan always suggests is a tenuous one. If we have to make that compromise, let's make sure to be aware that this is a compromise. And that this history, the agnatology that we will use in order to recover this experience, can teach us how to create alternative, autonomous, and I mean truly autonomous, system of education, system of academies, system of education of children that is autonomous from the state. So I do believe that the best way, the best proposal, the best way for us to go forward is to create a world confederation of autonomous schools, of autonomous spaces, of autonomous educational institutions. We should be smart. 
we should use the existing resources of institutions to first create cracks from within, institutional spaces from within that are somewhat autonomous, and then to balkanize from the educational spaces of capitalist modernity and replace them with the World Confederation of Autonomous Centers and Academies organized and federated from below. Now, as Abdullah Hojalan reminds us, true generosity towards the future consists of researching the past and giving everything to the present. We learn, as John Keats once said, from what we experience on our pulses. That means we need to experiment, we need to experience, we need to do as much as possible. We need to do everything. We don't have much time. We have to crack, to borrow a phrase from, from John, we have to crack education. We have to break this alliance between science power structures. We have to make schools, our schools, autonomous schools, places that can teach us how to live in a free society. In a society where, as Kropotkin used to write, there is bread for the spirit, bread for the heart, and bread for the body for everyone. So thank you very much, and I'm really excited to hear what everybody else has to say.